welcome to all of you uh, for today's meeting of the Pickwick Club, sponsored by the Dickens Project at UC Santa Cruz. And uh, before I turn things over to my colleague, Renee Fox, who will introduce today's speaker, I wanted to say just a couple of words about the Dickens Universe which is the annual summer conference sponsored by the Dickens Project. It takes place this year on the campus in person at UC Santa Cruz from July 23rd to July 29th. That's from a Sunday to a Saturday. It's six days of uh, intensive study, conversation and Victorian fun. Um, it's, uh, as I like to say, it's a cross between a uh, scholarly conference uh, and summer camp. And uh, this year, the focus of the Dickens Universe is a tale of two cities. We have a, an excellent lineup of speakers. And if you have not done so already, I encourage you to uh, go to the Dickens Project website and click on the link to the Dickens Universe. And you'll read there a description of the Dickens Universe. You'll see a program uh, or uh, a list of uh, the speakers, the schedule for the week, which is a very busy schedule. And uh, you'll also find a link to the registration information. So um, many of you I see uh, on, uh, Today's uh, program on the little pictures on my screen have attended Dickens Universe before. Uh, I hope you will return. And if there are newcomers, first timers, um, it's just a lot of fun. So Tale of Two Cities, the last week in July. So with that, I'll turn things over to my colleague and co-director Renee Fox, who will introduce uh, today's speaker. So, Renee. Thank you, John. Um, we are so excited that Tyson Stolte is joining us today to, um, to talk about his work on Dickens and Victorian psychology. Tyson is an associate professor and director of undergrad studies in the Department of English at New Mexico State University. He arrived at NMSU in 2012 after earning his PhD at the University of British Columbia. And since then, he's taught broadly in the Victorian period. And um, he wanted us to let you know that he makes sure to include Dickens in his classes as often as he possibly can. In his research, Tyson explores many intersections between Victorian literature and science. Um, before the publication last year of Dickens, in Victorian psychology, which as you can see from your screen is the book that he's gonna talk about today. He published other work on Dickens and 19th century theories of mind in journals like Novel, A Forum on Fiction and Victorian Literature and Culture. He also contributed a chapter on Dickens and psychology to the Oxford Handbook of Charles Dickens, which our own John Jordan is one of the co-editors of and one of the other co-editors, Bob Patton is also joining us here today. Tyson has also published articles on other connections between Victorian literature and science. He's written about the way Edward Fitzgerald's Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam engages with Victorian theories of matter and energy, that's one example, and also about the ways that Robert Browning and others turn to Victorian psychology to theorize prosody during the period. Tyson has another chapter on poetry about James Thompson. That's done. He hopes to turn back to thinking about Dickens. So um, please join us in welcoming him. And we are very excited to, to hear him talk about his book. So Tyson, to you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you uh, to everyone who um, did all the work behind the scenes to get me here today. Thank you to Renee and to Courtney and to John um, and to everyone else who made this possible. And thank you to all of you for coming to hear me talk about uh, this book and um, one of the chapters from the book about Edwin Drood on this Memorial Day weekend. Um, so I look forward to hearing your thoughts um, questions and comments once I have um, given you my, my spiel. So I'm going to start with an overview of the book. Uh, and then in the last part of the talk, I want to offer you uh, a shorter version of one of the chapters of the book. 
So let me begin. <clears throat> Although I trust that this is a crowd broadly sympathetic to Charles Dickens, it would perhaps still be best to begin with my title. If the audiences to which I presented this work in the past are any indication, there will be at least some here today who are skeptical that Charles Dickens could have anything to say about Victorian psychology. George Eliot and Victorian psychology, sure. But Dickens? George Orwell spoke for many readers when he insisted that, quote, Dickens' characters have no mental life, nor was Orwell's declaration merely a case of anachronism, yet another instance of 20th century readers' propensity to miss the specifics of 19th century psychological debate. Dickens' contemporaries, after all, could be equally dismissive of Dickens' ability to represent the mind. Eliot herself found in Dickens' fiction um, only a false psychology. But it's her partner George Henry Lewis's Dickens in Relation to Criticism, published two years after Dickens' death, that I think best gets to the heart of what was at stake in such claims about Dickens' fiction in the 19th century. Lewis can also help us see what motivated Dickens' turn to first-person narration, the subject of my book, just as Lewis's essay illuminates the factors that undercut Dickens' efforts to take a position in the psychological debates, sorry, to use fiction to take a position in the psychological debates that roiled Victorian Britain. It's with Lewis, then, that I'd like to begin. Searching in Dickens in relation to criticism for a metaphor whereby he might best capture the tendency of Dickens characters to express themselves through the same repeated phrase or the same compulsive tick, Lewis turns to his own psychophysiological studies. When one thinks of the catchwords personified as characters, he writes, one is reminded of the frogs whose brains have been taken out for physiological purposes and whose actions henceforth want the distinctive peculiarity of organic action, that of fluctuating spontaneity. Place one of these brainless frogs on his back and he will at once recover the sitting posture. Draw a leg from under him and he will draw it back again. In work like his Physiology of Common Life, Lewis had pointed to just such brainless frogs to argue for a physiological theory of mind. Two years after Lewis's essay on Dickens, T.H. Huxley would go even further. Using the automatic actions of decerebrated frogs, frogs with their brains taken out, to position consciousness as merely a coincident phenomenon of bodily life, like the steam whistle on a locomotive thus denying the possibility of the minds being able to influence the body, a doctrine he rightly anticipated would be scorned as, quote, fatalism, materialism, and atheism. If Lewis never goes quite so far, the language of his essay on Dickens and the metaphors for which he there reaches very clearly articulate his own psychophysiological commitments. Commitments to precisely the sort of reductionist psychological theory, that is, the sort of psychological theory that erased the difference between body and mind, or that found in the body the source of the mind, that I argue Dickens' novels resist. It's thus in the context of psychological controversy, of the broad shift in, the, in psychology in the 19th century toward more material theories of mind that we ought to read the complaints of Lewis and indeed of many of Dickens' contemporaries about his characterization. Decades before Lewis's essay, as Dickens was beginning his career in the 1830s and 1840s, the assumption that the mind was immaterial, that however it might be limited or influenced by the flesh in this life, it could not be reduced to mere matter, represented something like psychological orthodoxy, as numerous historians of science have noted. Because of the ontological difference between mind and matter, such dualist mental scientists argued that the examination of consciousness required its own methods, distinct from those of the physical sciences. As John Abercrombie puts it in his Inquiries Concerning the Intellectual Powers in the Investigation of Truth, a book that long occupied a place on Dickens' shelves, the only field in which the mental philosopher can pursue his researches with perfect confidence is his own mind. After all, Abercrombie insists, the mind can be compared to nothing in nature. It has been endowed by its creator with the power of perceiving external things, 
but the manner in which it does so is entirely beyond our comprehension. To be clear, introspection, turning inward to examine one's own mind, essentially, had a place in a broad range of psychologies throughout the century. But the insistence of dualist mental scientists that it must remain the key methodology for the study of mind was at least in part motivated by the way that introspection seemed to grant consciousness a significance that forestalled reductionist arguments. The way it helped dualist writers resist the argument, increasingly prevalent as Dickens' career went on, that the mind was a product of the brain and nerves, and thus that physical methods might be sufficient for psychological investigation. After all, the consequences of such arguments seemed dire. As Huxley knew, because of the widespread assumption that it was in the spirit, not the flesh, that we would experience immortality, attacks on the immateriality of the mind were received by many as attacks on the truth of religion and the possibility of a future life. And so we find our way back to Lewis. Lewis's critique of Dickens' characters by way of those brainless frogs takes for granted a methodology that did seem to threaten to reduce mind to brain. It is vivisection, such as removing the brains from living frogs, as Richard Menke has argued, that enables Lewis to pronounce so definitively on Dickens' fiction, just as it is such physiological experiment and not the introspection that remained the central methodology of dualist theories of mind that represents the way to psychological knowledge for Lewis. Lewis, in other words, takes aim at Dickens' psychological beliefs as surely as his characterization. His critique in Dickens in relation to criticism, like his insistence elsewhere in that essay, that Dickens was no thinker, that he was, in Lewis's words, completely outside philosophy, science, and the higher literature, and was too unaffected a man to pretend to feel any interest in them, is the expression of a psychological objection as much as anything else. For Dickens insists in his fiction upon the distinction between mind and body. There is, for him, a fundamental ontological difference between the two. We come now to one of the key arguments of Dickens and Victorian psychology, an essential means by which Dickens underscores this difference between mind and body is through his use of first-person narration, for this narrative mode constitutes for him a means to replicate the introspection that served as the key methodology for a mainstream dualism. Indeed, my book argues that we can locate an essential intersection of the 19th century novel and Victorian psychology in the narrative mode of the first-person novel. To repeat, introspection was not solely associated with the dualist psychology that Dickens champions, nor is the point of view of every fictional autobiography at mid-century an implicit endorsement of dualism. But for Dickens, I suggest, the perspective did offer precisely such an endorsement. My book's focus on first-person narration also offers a rebuttal to claims about the superficiality of Dickens' characterization. If the bundles of ticks and fixed phrases that otherwise populate his novels represent only a false psychology, in Eliot's words again, the same cannot be said, or so I suggest, of Dickens' introspective narrators. My book therefore focuses on the increasing space that Dickens allowed such an introspective perspective, that he allowed the first-person point of view, beginning in his novels of the late 1830s and the 1840s, in order to argue that both what the novels say about the mind and how they say it constitute efforts on Dickens' part to argue for an immaterial mind, a position he defended in the face of the inroads made toward establishing a viable psychophysiology by writers like Lewis. I define first-person narration broadly, including under that heading narration ranging from passages of inwardness articulated through free and direct discourse to entire novels narrated by a first-person narrator. But while the first chapters of the book show Dickens granting increasing space to such introspection and growing increasingly skeptical of approaches that sought to know the mind through the body, the second half of Dickens and Victorian psychology tells a messier story, describing developments in physicalist psychology that undercut the effectiveness of introspection as a means of defending the immateriality 
and immortality of mind. That is, while Dickens and Victorian psychology offers both a richer sense of the depth and breadth of Dickens' intellectual life and a new approach to Dickens' fiction, it also does more than that by tracing how first-person narration served as a means by which Dickens could insist on the irreducibility of consciousness, on the impossibility of explaining consciousness as merely a consequence of physiology, my book equally focuses attention on an under-examined formal means by which the Victorian novel contributed to the formation and the spread of psychological knowledge. Of course, introspection, as I've noted, served as an important tool in any number of diverse theories of the mind in the period. For that reason, Dickens' own use of first-person narration to insist upon the mind's fundamental difference from the body helps to illuminate the nuances and ambiguities of that range of diverse theories, just as the novels on which I focus help us see the particular significance that the Victorians attached to those details. Dickens' introspective fictions also reveal how such ambiguities could be strategic, how they could be deployed and leveraged by physicalist theorists of mind, those who threaten to reduce mind to body, in order to gain a hearing for their own work. I contend that just as Lewis so successfully turned Dickens' characters to his own theoretical ends, using those characters as illustrative examples of his own physiological theory of mind, psychophysiologists redefined the terminology of an earlier dualist mental philosophy in order to oppose the very thinkers whose language they had appropriated. It was such strategies, I argue, that finally rendered ineffective Dickens' own introspective case, that is, his own narrative case, for dualism. That is, the shortcomings of Dickens' first-person fictions, rather than proving Dickens to be no thinker, as Lewis would have it, instead offer an ideal opportunity to trace some of the key rhetorical means by which physicalist psychologies were able to prove so successful in psychological debate over the course of the 19th century. In the remainder of my time today, I want to show some of these strategies at work by turning to a version of the argument of my book's fifth chapter, which focuses on a novel many of you have recently read, The Mystery of Edwin Drood. In its opening moments, you may recall, Drood seems to offer a return to the introspective narration of consciousness that was at the heart of Dickens' efforts to insist upon an immaterial mind. An ancient English cathedral town? How can the ancient English cathedral town be here? The well-known massive gray square tower of its old cathedral? How can that be here? There is no spike of rusty iron in the air between the eye and it from any point of the real prospect. What is the spike that intervenes? And who has set it up? Stay. Is the spike so low a thing as the rusty spike on the top of a post of an old bedstead that has tumbled all awry? Some vague period of drowsy laughter must be devoted to the consideration of this possibility. By the novel's second paragraph, of course, this moment of apparently unmediated access to the intoxicated mind of John Jasper, this moment in which his scattered consciousness slowly pieces itself together in the words of the novel, is replaced by the third-person point of view through which the remainder of what exists of the novel is narrated. From that external perspective, the degree to which Jasper is aware of and responsible for his own actions comes to stand as among the novel's key mysteries, as Joe Maidus has argued. Of course, this opening paragraph calls into question whether an inward view of Jasper's mind would be any more illuminating, a question to which I want to return in our discussion after the talk. Still, although Edwin Drood's opening moments of first-person narration seem to be only a bit of misdirection, a means to frustrate our expectations, and while the novel hints that Jasper is thoroughly alienated from his own mind, it seems safe to assume that Dickens was laying the groundwork in the novel's completed numbers for the sorts of closural gestures that might have enabled the continuation of the psychological project that I trace in my book. But as the novel stands, unfinished, Edwin Drood only reveals the final ways in which Dickens' project, his efforts to offer the introspective view of consciousness as a means to insist upon the immateriality and immortality of mind, came itself to be frustrated. So, 
While the reading on which I want to spend the rest of my time does not directly consider first-person narration, Jasper's seemingly fractured consciousness, the apparent limits of his self-knowledge, nevertheless shed light on the way psychophysiology was engaged in rewriting the terminology of mainstream Christian theories of mind. Our access to Jasper's inward view may end after a single paragraph, but it's nevertheless his mind that is at the center of Dickens' efforts to defend the immaterial and the religious in this novel. Of course, Jasper's psychology has already drawn considerable attention in discussions of Dickens' final work. Whatever Edwin's ultimate fate, dead or alive, critics seem confident that Jasper is guilty of something, and much of what has been written about the novel has focused on parsing his criminal psyche. For my present purposes, what is most telling is the way that the novel, as Eve Sedgwick long ago noted, attempts to insulate Jasper's psychology from that of the text's more wholesome characters. Dickens remarks of Rosa Budd's attempts to understand Jasper, for, for instance, what could she know of the criminal intellect which its own professed students perpetually misread? because they persist in trying to reconcile it with the average intellect of average men, instead of identifying it as a horrible wonder apart. But why might Dickens be so eager to cordon off Jasper's psychology from the minds of the novel's other characters? Sedgwick's own answer to that question lies in her reading of the novel's homophobia. I'd like to suggest that the novel's fears equally have to do with the understanding of the mind that seems to underlie Dickens' depiction of Jasper. Beginning with the interior, mon interior monologue that opens the novel, Jasper's psyche is presented to us as being split. Numerous critics have charted Jasper's internal tension between Eastern impulses and English ones. Others have read in his mind a struggle between conscious and unconscious drives. More tangibly, Jasper serves as lay presenter by day and opium addict by night, acting his part in the church, yet troubled internally by what he calls some stray sort of ambition, aspiration, restlessness, dissatisfaction. Jasper's is surely more than a case of hypocrisy or misleading appearances, moreover. His shifts between what the novel calls two extreme states are accompanied by physical signs, such as the film that creeps across his eyes. That is, Jasper's duplicity seems to be a bodily condition. And, if John Forster is to be believed, the novel was finally to reveal almost a total split between what we might call Jasper's two selves. Forster writes, The story was to be that of the murder of a nephew by his uncle the originality of which was to consist in the review of the murderer's career by himself at the close, when its temptations were to be dwelt upon as if not he the culprit, but some other man were the tempted. The clue most often seized upon by critics in order to make sense of Jasper's split identity lies in a comment made about another character in the novel, Miss Twinkleton, mistress of the school that Rosa Budd attends. Describing the division between her public and private personas, Dickens writes, as in some cases of drunkenness and in others of animal magnetism, there are two states of consciousness which never clash, but each of which pursues its separate course as though it were continuous instead of broken. Thus, if I hide my watch when I am drunk, I must be drunk again before I can remember where. So Miss Twinkleton has two distinct and separate phases of being. And I want you to keep that last phrase in mind, distinct and separate. I'm going to come back to it in a minute. As others have noted, one cannot read this passage without being struck by its applicability to Jasper as well. But what is key for my argument here is the source from which Dickens is typically understood to be drawing, the work of Dr. John Eliotson, his friend and former physician. The passage seems to allude to Eliotson's discussion in his Human Physiology, another book that Dickens owned, of precisely such dissociative states. The example of losing one's belongings while drunk, only to find them when drunk again, comes straight from Eliotson's quotation in that book of the phrenologist George Combe. Dr. Abel informed me, says Mr. Combe, of an Irish porter to a warehouse who forgot when sober what he had done when drunk. 
but being drunk, again recollected the transactions of his former state of intoxication. On one occasion being drunk, he had lost a parcel of some value, and in his sober moments could give no account of it. Next time he was intoxicated, he recollected that he had left the parcel at a certain house, and there being no address on it, it had remained there safely and was got on his calling for it. This man must have had two souls, one for his sober state and one for him when drunk. I'll return in a moment to that last comment by Eliotson here, um, but I should note that those of you who are fans of the novels of Wilkie Collins will likely remember this passage. It's exactly this passage that Ezra Jennings reads to Franklin Blake in The Moonstone. I won't say anything more lest I ruin that novel for you. The allusion to Eliotson, as other critics have noted, evokes a condition that the Victorians labeled double consciousness, a term used in the 19th century to describe a rigid split in a subject's knowledge and awareness. Most frequently, the sufferer would fall into a deep and prolonged sleep, awaking with no apparent memory of their past life. Victorian case histories often describe these subjects as having to relearn in their second state all they had known in the previous one, from handwriting to the identities of family members and friends. These alternate states also typically brought with them different personalities. Often the subject went from being reserved, perhaps slightly morose, to high-spirited and rebellious. Sufferers made multiple switches between states, and these individuals were, in most cases, entirely unaware of their experiences from one state to the other. Those affected by the malady thus had two complete and separate sets of memories, and as such, patients are often described, as in the passage from Edwin Drood, as leading to entirely separate existences. Significantly for my reading of Edwin Drood, by 1870, an increasingly material understanding of double consciousness had taken hold among mental scientists. A generation earlier, in the years when Eliotson was writing, more than one writer had connected the doubling of consciousness with the two hemispheres of the brain. Arthur Ladbroke Wigan, for instance, went so far as to argue that each cerebral hemisphere was capable of a distinct and separate volition. And of course, distinct and separate is precisely the language that Dickens used for Miss Twinkleton. But by 1870, many others explained the malady through the reflex action of the nerves and brain, the very function, you'll recall, on which Huxley founded his argument that consciousness was no more capable of volition than the steam whistle was capable of making the locomotive go. As Huxley understood, such explanations had the potential to trouble the religious precisely because they threatened to reduce the soul or mind to the physical matter of the brain and nerves. If Eliotson's explanation for double consciousness differed from those of the late 1860s and early 1870s, the controversial and, quote, notoriously materialist Eliotson, to borrow Alison Winter's phrase, hardly offered comfort to a dualist like Dickens. Eliotson, it should be noted, argues that rather than eliminating the soul, double consciousness ought to prove two souls to exist, one for each state of consciousness. And of course, that's the phrase he returns to in the story of the drunken Irish porter. But while such a solution might appear to square double consciousness with a dualist, if unorthodox, understanding, it's clear from Eliotson's work that such was not his goal. His point is that we have no soul, not two. By the time that Dickens began Edwin Drood, of course, Eliotson's model was long out of date, which seems like part of why Dickens alludes to it in the novel. But some more current psychophysiologists repeated the two-soul explanation of double consciousness. Their use of that hypothesis, however, was no more a capitulation to orthodox psychological thinkers than Eliotson's. Rather, such explanations depended on the work done by numerous physicalist theorists in the intervening years to empty the word soul of any metaphysical meaning. Lewis, for example, reduced soul to consciousness in his work, positioning that consciousness as known through and indeed dependent on the body. No wonder then that double consciousness might represent a site of anxiety for Dickens about the nature of the mind. Such materialist understandings must be safely cordoned off in the horrible wonder apart the novel asserts is Jasper's psyche. 
Dickens' displacement of Eliotson's story of Combe's drunken Irish porter onto Miss Twinkleton would seem to be a parallel effort to deflate the threat of such physical conceptions of the mind. Twinkleton's split identity is of a type we find frequently in Dickens. She hardly differs from such characters as Mr. Dorrit or Great Expectations Wemmick, who also possess discrete, private, and public selves. Such a split is exaggerated and distanced from the real world. It is figurative rather than literal, and thus should offer no serious threat to a dualist understanding of the self. But the novel's displacement of double consciousness onto Miss Twinkleton, I argue, has just the opposite effect. Instead of deflating the threat of double consciousness, it works to suggest the universality of Jasper's condition, and thus to undermine the novel's efforts to insulate his psychology. Double consciousness, as the story of Combe's drunken Irish porter should make clear, was not a unique ailment but part of a constellation of similar abnormal states that interested writers of Victorian psychological texts. The way the condition was constructed in such works was informed by discussions of dreams, drunkenness, somnambulism or sleepwalking, and mesmerism. And double consciousness was often explicitly equated or conflated with those states. Because of the disorder's links with those other conditions, how the mind was conceptualized in theories of double consciousness could have implications for areas of psychology far removed from that particular ailment. For to some degree, double consciousness was constructed as but an extreme form of more common states of mind. And indeed, many critics have noted that internal divisions can be found in nearly every one of the novel's characters. In addition to Twinkleton, we have, for example, Durdles, who speaks of himself in the third person perhaps being a little misty as to his own identity when he narrates in the novel's words. But while such fractured selfhood is to be found everywhere in Dickens, as I've noted, my point is that such fracturing assumes a more ominous tone in this novel, precisely because of the novel's invocation of double consciousness. In a sense, according to the model of the mind that double consciousness threatens to bring with it, our minds are all fundamentally unintelligible as Jasper says, of those among whom he finds himself in the opium den in the novel's first chapter. For a dualist like Dickens, it bears repeating, consciousness stood for was indeed indistinguishable from the immortal soul itself, and thus for the hope of a future life. It's easy to see then how troubling might be the way that double consciousness and the reflex function through which it was frequently explained made the limits of consciousness feel like they were receding, comprising less and less of physical and mental function. If a great deal of our bodily activity, even a great deal of our thought and memory, is con controlled by something outside consciousness, a bodily force that operates potentially outside our control, there's a real and frightening sense in which we are not ourselves. The rippling out of the implications of the novel's allusion to theories of double consciousness is equally to be seen in the way the condition inflects the novel's representation of automatic behavior. The novel certainly shows us several characters who seem like the kind of automata to which reflex theories of thought might threaten to reduce us. That angular man, Grugis, speaks mechanically and as if by rote, and his face is at one point compared with the face of a clock. The journeymen in Dirtle's yard are compared to mechanical emblems of time and death. The waiters that Grugis hires for his dinner with Edwin operate in a most machine-like fashion. We're told of Jasper, too, that he has only a mechanical harmony with those around him. And Princess Puffer's ability to play him, to adjust his body in order to make him speak, also calls into question the degree to which human life is mechanical, simply a matter of reflex. The degree, that is, to which we have something in common with those decerebrated frogs with which I began today. Of course, this too is a standard criticism of Dickens' characters. It's Mr. Micawber, after all, whom Lewis compares to such frogs in the passage from Dickens in relation to criticism that I quoted earlier. My point with regard to Edwin Drood, though, is that the novel's allusion to Eliotson's quotation of Combe spills over into the novel's broader representation of the mind in ways that make this text seem deeply tainted by materialism. For example, 
The dust of decaying corpses, we are told, covers cloistrum, and that dead matter is hard to distinguish from the matter of the living. Stony dirtles or the arid, sandy Mr. Grugis seem equally defined by their dustiness. In part, the blurring of the line between living and dead seems traceable to the town's cannibalistic food supply. Cloisterum children grow small salad in the dust of abbots and abbesses and make dirt pies of nuns and friars, while every plowman in its outlying fields renders to one's puissant lord treasurers, archbishops, bishops, and such like the attention which the ogre in the storybook desired to render to his unbidden visitor and grinds their bones to make his bread. Nothing in this passage points beyond the physical, or gestures to the immortality of the soul that once animated Cloisterum's dust, except, perhaps, the final allusion to the world of fairy tale, which works in Dickens' representation of hard times Louisa Gradgrind to suggest an inborn quality of mind, imagination, or fancy that transcends experience and our current plane of existence. On its own, though, this is hardly an adequate foundation for faith. As Edwin Drood stands, Dickens' invocation of double consciousness seems to push readers, readers towards the contrary conclusion, that we are nothing more than our bodies, nothing more than the matter that rots in the grave. Yet we can safely assume, and most critics have, that the novel, had it been completed, would, like Dickens' other novels, have worked toward redemption and resolution, toward eliminating the fragmentation and dispelling the materialism on which I've been focusing. Perhaps Jasper would have been redeemed, as is suggested by the fragment of Ezekiel 1827 that is being sung as he rushes to the cathedral at the end of chapter one. When the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed, and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. As Dickens wrote to John Maycomb only a few days before he died, I have always striven in my writings to express veneration for the life and lessons of our Savior, and the novel he was writing was clearly to be no exception. Even in the portion Dickens completed, the novel gestures at some element of existence that transcends the here and now. Note this typically Dickensian description of Mr. Grugis gazing at the heavens, which, with the simple word yet, offers a promise of a future life. His gaze wandered from the windows to the stars, as if he would have read in them something that was hidden from him. Many of us would if we could, but none of us so much as know our letters in the stars yet, or seem likely to in this state of existence, and few languages can be read until their alphabets are mastered. Jasper's two states are here replaced by the division between this life and the next, and the unintelligibility of much of the self, according to reflex theories of mind, is here answered with the promise of coherence in the next state of existence. Even among the images of mechanical selfhood I've already discussed, the novel hints at some higher guiding force that directs automatic actions. Surely it's such guidance that leads Chris Barkle's distracted steps toward cloisterum weir. He often walked to the weir, and consequently there was nothing remarkable in his footsteps tending that way. But the preoccupation of his mind so hindered him from planning any walk or taking heed of the objects he passed that his first consciousness of being near the weir was derived from the sound of falling water close at hand. How did I come here? was his first thought as he stopped. Why did I come here? was his second. Then he stood intently listening to the water. A familiar passage in his reading about airy tongues that syllable men's names rose so unbidden to his ear that he put it from him with his hand, as if it were tangible. Chris Sparkle can neither explain why his body led him to the weir, nor control the thoughts, the almost tangible thoughts, that unbidden fill his head. But the aura of mystery that surrounds this scene, which leads, of course, to Chris Barkle's discovery of Edwin's missing watch and shirt pin, gestures toward the ineffable aspects of identity, the heightened perceptive powers of which the unfettered soul is capable. If those models of the mind that underwrote contemporary conceptions of double consciousness and other related states held that Chris Barkle's automatic actions were guided by nothing more profound than his body's reflex arc, 
that explanation seems wholly inadequate in the face of the transparently plotted nature of Chris Barkle's discovery at the Weir. It's an impoverished view of consciousness in the mind, the novel implies, that finds in such a scene only the reflex actions of our bodily shell. An even more telling attempt to deny the merely physical understanding of existence is to be found in the final chapter that Dickens wrote. A brilliant morning shines on the old city. Its antiquities and ruins are surpassingly beautiful, with the lusty ivy gleaming in the sun and the rich trees waving in the balmy air. Changes of glorious light from moving boughs, songs of birds, scents from gardens, woods, and fields, or rather, from the one great garden of the whole cultivated island in its yielding time, penetrate into the cathedral, subdue its earthy odor, and preach the resurrection and the life. In other words, the novel asserts that the regeneration of dead organic matter into the basis for future life, that is, the growing of small salad in the dust of abbots and abbesses, is not the only form of resurrection on offer, but rather a symbol of the greater resurrection to come, our immaterial ascension to heaven at death. But at this point, I should make a confession. In the argument that I've been articulating so far, I've offered you something of a false dichotomy. I have opposed to the idea of resurrection, the materialist or physicalist notions of the mind that underlie, if only as traces, the concept of double consciousness. But many of those who outlined even the most materialist ideas of double consciousness still insisted on their belief in a Christian afterlife. Eliotson, again, is perhaps the most interesting spokesperson for this position. At one point in human physiology, having mocked at great length the notion of an immaterial soul offered by another writer, Eliotson writes, Materialists may not only believe in God, but in the divine authority of Scripture, and more honor Scripture by looking implicitly in full faith to it alone as God's authority for their belief in a future state, than those who endeavor to make its declarations more probable by fancying a soul immortal in its own nature and independent of matter. When the scripture tells us we shall rise as matter with bodies and go to heaven with bodies, where Christ, God himself, sits bodily as matter, flesh, blood, and bones in the words of the Church of England. My suggestion is that the allusion to Combs' drunken Irish porter, the novel's invocation of Eliotson, inevitably brings with it the traces of this model of immortality. Dickens' efforts to preach the resurrection and the life, then, cannot help but suggest the purely physical resurrection envisioned by Eliotson. With that connection in mind, I'd like to turn to the clearest images of resurrection that the novel offers. Dirtle's work as a resurrection man of sorts, his constant unearthing of the remains of those he calls the old uns. We are told of Dirtle's that he is better acquainted with the cathedral crypt than any living authority. It may even be than any dead one. With his hammer and two-foot rule, he incessantly sounds every corner of the crypt, announcing his discoveries to the chief verger as he goes. His encounters with the dead are all reiterations of the same scene. In his words, Dirtles come upon the old chap, in reference to a buried magnate of ancient time and high degree, by striking right into the coffin with his pick. The old chap gave Dirtles a look with his open eyes, as much as to say, is your name Dirtles? Why, my man, I've been waiting for you a devil of a time. And then he turned to powder. This prosopopoeia of the corpses he finds ironizes the harrowing of hell. Dirtles, like Christ, rescues from their subterranean, if not quite hellish prisons, the dead who have been impatiently awaiting his arrival. More importantly, these repeated scenes invoke Eliotson's image of a material resurrection. Yet this material resurrection is no resurrection at all. The physical forms Dirtles unearths last only long enough to acknowledge Dirtles' presence. No sooner are they released from their graves, but they disappear into the dust that is everywhere in Cloistrum. In place of a resurrected self, we are left with only absence a cloud of dust, instead of either an immortal soul or a material body. Here, then, 
is the novel most troublingly inflected by the physical resonances of double consciousness. Judging from the other novels I discuss in my book, it seems most likely that Dickens' point in his treatment of dirtles is to suggest the fragility and insignificance of flesh. Dust we are, and to dust we shall return, but some part of us transcends the physical, transcends mortality. The figure of a corpse that disappears upon contact with the air was, after all, one Dickens had used before. Describing Lady Dedlock's response to Guppy's goading in Bleak House, for example, he writes that her exclamation and her dead condition seem to have passed away like the features of those long-preserved dead bodies sometimes opened up in tombs, which, struck by the air like lightning, vanish in a breath. Surely, Dickens' employment of the image of rapid decomposition in Edwin Drood would have pointed to the same dualist conclusions as in Bleak House if Dickens had lived to finish this novel. But as it stands, Dickens' efforts to endorse a dualist psychology and resist the encroachment of materialism in his final novel ultimately fail to guide readers unambiguously, in large part because of the varied and contradictory meanings loaded by 1870 onto the shared language of psychology, even onto the very word soul. Whatever his intentions in his representation of Dirtle's unearthing of the oldens, their decomposition at the moment of resurrection therefore comes to look like a suggestion that death is the end of being, the ultimate negation, rather than a rebirth into a new world. In this light, consider Grugis's difficulties in describing for Rosa the end of life. Life is pounds, shillings, and pence. Death is a sudden recollection of the death of her two parents seemed to stop him. And he said in a softer tone, and evidently inserting the negative as an afterthought, death is not pounds, shillings, and pence. My point is that because Edwin Drood was never completed, its position on the nature of death is no more definite than Grugis's. Indeed, the initial interruption of Grugis's speech stands as a particularly apt figure for the novel's own incomplete message. It, too, merely tells us that death is. In Edwin Drood, however, Dickens never had a chance to finish the thought. Thus, while the mystery of Edwin Drood attempts to preach the resurrection and the life, those efforts ultimately prove as empty as Dirtles leaves the coffins he discovers. Dickens, it seems, cannot finally square the psychological discourse he employs in his final work with the religious narrative he wishes that work to tell. The introspective view, meanwhile, the perspective that elsewhere had offered Dickens' strongest defense against material theories of mind, as I argue in the book, here only promises to reveal the ever-narrowing bounds of consciousness, cut off from meaningful control of life or thought. As I've sought to demonstrate, Dickens and Victorian psychology reveals a Dickens who was attuned to the latest developments in mental science, a Dickens who even contributed to those developments, and it traces how he found in first-person narration a formal means by which to make his case. What we see in Edwin Drood is Dickens attempting to adopt new strategies to defend the same metaphysical positions that he had throughout his career. Here, as before, he tries to express his veneration, as I noted earlier, for the life and lessons of our Savior. But the physicalist demand that explanations of mental function be grounded in that which could be empirically observed and measured, as I argue throughout my book, meant that psychology had become increasingly focused on the here and now, on what could be known. The language of mental science, meanwhile, had slowly been made in many ways inconsistent with the Christian assumptions of an earlier theory of mind. Even the soul, the foundation of Christian dualism, had been reinscribed in material terms by the 1870s. What the final incompletion of Drood underscores, then, is just how difficult it had become by the time of Dickens' death to marshal the language of psychology in the service of the transcendent, of that which went beyond mere earthly understanding. Thank you. Thank so, you so uh, Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, um, I, I 
um, I know that you are are interested and eager to have questions. So um, I think do you have a do you have a way that you prefer to field questions? Uh, no, I don't. Um, I guess just if if people want to raise hands or I don't know if there's anything in the chat. Whoops. Yeah. Um, so maybe if folks can use the raise hand function and Tyson, do you want to, do you want to call on people yourself? So you, you can, or would you prefer if I do it? Maybe you should do it just cause, um, yeah, <laughs> just because. Okay. Uh, so questions. I should say, I also have questions if, uh, if that seems like a better way to start things. <laughs> Bob has a question. I think you're muted, Bob. There we go. Can, we, we go. can you hear me now? Okay. All the way through the 1840s, um, Dickens is, is often refu uh, re using tempests uh, in almost a biblical way. I mean, if to overthrowing, you know, whether it's a huge wind that overthrows Chuzzlewit at the beginning <laughs> of that book, or the wind that uh, kills people in, in David Copperfield. Um, and at the beginning, well, in the middle of Edwin Drood, the night of Christmas Eve, there is an enormous tempest, which one could feel had some kind of um, extraterritorial kind of uh, force. Mm -hmm. And it breaks the hands of the clock of the cathedral. Mm -hmm. What time has been broken? And how could it be fixed? Edwin Drood's time, human time, the immemorial uh, uh, inactivity of uh, the city itself, which seems to be still in its medieval term. And how would Dickens <laughs> resurrect that in the end? I don't know. I mean, it's just always bothered me. I feel like Maybe his time ended because he couldn't find a time that lasted. Edwin Drew's time or Dickens' time, you mean? Dickens's. Yeah. I mean, rereading the novel this time um, for this talk, I was struck, and I hadn't noticed this before, just to, to sort of add to what you're saying, by how many references there are to like the coming of the railroad and that sort of thing. And of course, Edwin is headed off to, to go and be an engineer in, in Egypt. Um, so he is this kind of like character of a of a sort of imperial and industrial modernity that that seems to run counter to cloisterum. Um, I, I'm glad that the first question is one that I frankly have absolutely no answer to. Um, <laughs> I think that starts things off on the right note. Um, yeah, I mean, if I had to, I guess I haven't thought too much about, about the breaking of the hands on the clock there, right? I mean, I think when I've read the novel, typically I've, I've read that storm as scene setting, obviously, um, maybe as, you know, a kind of externalization of Jasper's own um, inner turmoil. And, and, and one of the questions that is, is worth wrestling with in this novel is how seriously we take that argument to Forster's, right? Do we actually believe that we're meant to see Jasper as entirely alienated? Um, and so I guess, depending on how you answer that question, um, is, is Jasper aware of what he's doing to Edwin Drood, assuming that he's murdering him at this moment? Is this a kind of externalization of, of the psychic turmoil of that? Um, I mean, you can see I'm, I'm floundering here a little bit. Um, I think also maybe an easy way to read that is, is, yeah, I mean, I think the, the cop-out answer to that is to say it's Edwin Drood's time is is come to an end. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. Do you have thoughts, Bob? Well, only that I, I, I know what Forster said, and I know that he and, and Kate believed it. But since uh, the, uh, the novel of Wilkie Collins uh, 
in which this occurs was run in all the year round. I, I, I know of nothing in Dickens' life where Dickens wants to borrow and repeat what somebody else has done. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if Forster is putting whatever Dickens said into Forster's consciousness, which you know is affected by Wilkin Collins's novel and the the presence of of the uh, uh, you know of drugs that affect the mind, and that Dickens had something else in mind. But of course, there's also what the illustrator said uh, was uh, going to be to re represent things. I mean, at least it would be to have that, you know, climbing up into the tower to find an answer. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't think we're yet at uh, vertigo, <laughs> climbing up into the tower for an answer. Um, Christian, go ahead. Hi, thank you very much, Tyson. Um, my question, I, I love that you brought Dirtles next to Guster. I like that you talked a lot, of, a lot about these characters that I are so interesting in uh, Drood. My question is also about Drood, though, because it seems like uh, with the Landless Twins that you have a different kind of character to bring in. So there's the line about there's something tigerish in his blood. Mm -hmm. And so what I want to ask you about is like race and psychology, because it seems like when you say Victorian psychology, you maybe mean white Victorian psychology. And just can you elaborate on some of those issues? Yeah. Um... I mean, I, I think that that is absolutely the the kind of unspoken assumption. Um, maybe it's not even that unspoken in in most of this nineteenth century psychological psychological writing is that absolutely talking about white Europeans. Um, most of the interest is toward white European males, absolutely, um, and you do encounter a great deal of that kind of like racist assumptions of a sort of um, you know that that tigerishness, that animalism in. Um, in in non-white races um i mean what are you thinking about in terms of like the the division between neville and and helena oh i, I guess i'm wondering is dickens trying to wrestle with something more complicated than in previous works like in I, terms of race I, yeah and like giving maybe more of a racial complexity uh, psychological complexity to other races yeah mm. i mean I, I i wish that i could i wish that i could say that Right, because of course we want to sort of rescue. We want we want to insist that Dickens is thinking in more complicated ways. That Dickens is thinking in ways that would be um, less troubling. I guess I don't see it in the novel. Right. I, I, any any sense? I mean, any time that race gets mentioned with regard to the landless twins, it is offensive. Right. I mean, we see Edwin. You know, that's that's one of the the things that draws them to blows, draws him and Neville to blows is, is this kind of like accusation of, of some sort of like racial impurity in Neville. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know that I can think of any moment in this novel, in the treatment of Neville and, and Helena that does something more interesting. I, I wish I could say yes. I wish I had a great answer that said like, yeah, absolutely. Um, this is, you know, the, the, the start of branching off in a new and, and promising direction, but I just don't see it. All right, thank you very much. I also didn't, but I was hoping maybe you would <laughs> excavate something fascinating. Thank you. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> before we get to Harriet, there's a question in the Q and A that um that I wanted to to um to read to you, Tyson. And um, this is from this is from Haley. Um, as there was an ignorance as to the neurological and medical psychological functions as shown in the mere avoidance of certain surgical practices as they may interfere with the soul, like anything having to do with the heart and brain, ex is the existence of dual consciousness as posited here at odds with the representations of medicine in Dickens's work? Or is there even a representation of this that can be recollected and or connected? I mean, I'm 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 wondering, Haley, if if you want to say more about like what you're thinking about in terms of a sort of like ignorance of medicine. Because I don't I I don't know that I would necessarily agree with that as as what's going on in the 19th century. I mean, I don't think that the presence of the soul in 19th century psychological reading is necessarily an avoidance of an interest in physiology or an interest in what we would call neurology or anything like that. I think that um there's still 
you know, 19th century writers are still thinking in complicated ways about our physiological selves, about, you know, brain function and that sort of things. It's really just a matter of the relationship between that and, you know, some part of ourself that may transcend the physical or that may be detachable from the physical. So I don't think that those two things are intention. I think that you can be a dualist and still be smart and, and sort of complicated in your thinking about um, medicine or physiology. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't think that there's a contradiction there. I think it's just a matter of like getting to a point, talking about 19th century writing about the mind, getting to a point where you say, um, and, and this is really Rick Rylance's argument that like beyond this point is mystery, right? That we're reserving some sort of core or reserve, we're, we're, we're drawing a line and saying there are some things that we just can't answer. And we saw in that Abercrombie quote, you know, there's some things that we can't necessarily, we shouldn't even really be exploring like the connection between, you know, immaterial consciousness and the, the sort of physiological self. Um, but I don't think that that forestalls thinking in complicated ways about medicine or physiology. Is that kind of an answer or have I missed the point? Um, Haley, I think that you 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 can't um, talk out loud from wherever you are, but if you want to um, add something to the chat or respond in the chat, um, just go ahead and do that. Harriet, go ahead. So Tyson, first, I want to say thank you um, for a really illuminating talk. It was very interesting, um, very thoughtful and very um, dense and difficult. I'm a romanticist, so, so this takes me a little bit out of my comfort zone. Um, I'm wondering a lot about siblings. I, I love the point that just as um, Jasper has this split consciousness that depicts him as, a, as kind of vice, Miss Twinkleton, who arguably is not so virtuous, is still this kind of um, same representation of doubleness. And so now I'm thinking about um, sets of siblings that show up in the novel. One, of course, is the Landless twins who are split from one egg. Um, so, so I'm wondering in terms of what it means to be a twin, how that dual consciousness operates for them. Because when um, they're taught, one lesson works for both of them. And there's a, a sort of awareness of how Helena is morally superior Mm -hmm. And and yet there is that kind of, you know, that same kind of duality. And then another set of siblings who get very little attention, but they're the two China shepherdesses. <laughs> right? So so what to do with them? And then a third set of siblings who are not identified. And that is, I cannot for the life of me understand how Jasper can be Edwin's uncle when we are never told that Jasper has a sibling. So so how is Jasper related to Edwin? And, you know, that's a, that's another mystery of Edwin Drood that, that kind of intrigues me. And I know you don't know the answer to that because only half the novel is finished, which is a tremendous frustration. But thinking about those, those three sets of siblings, one that we can't know, but the other two that we do a little bit, and how they figure into this fabulous argument that you're making about dual consciousness and the soul. It's a big question. Yeah, I, big person. I, I I wonder if if anyone has seen. Um, I think it's the BBC version of this that came out. I want to say six seven years ago with um, is it Matthew Reese, the one from the Americans as John Jasper, yeah. <gasps> any looks of, of recognition. So in that one, I'll just ruin it for you. Um, <laughs> one of the big revelations at the end is that in fact John Jasper is Edwin's brother. Um, <gasps> I don't think, and and others can maybe correct. I don't think there's any evidence in you know in any obscure letters or anything that, that would suggest that that's um, something Dickens had in mind. Uh, so I'm not going to make an argument about about those two as twins or brothers or whatever. Um, but yeah, in I mean, that aspect of the landless is, is and and the China Shepherdess is I. I I don't know that I have much to say, but I don't know that I've ever actually thought about them. Um, but in terms of loudnesses, yeah, of course, right? That there, we do get this kind of suggestion of a sort of like shared consciousness, um, uh, you know, a, a single mind or something. Um, but I mean, so you're you're wondering, Harriet, what this has to do with just the the, the kind of theme of doubling or thinking about the soul or... 
thinking about, I mean, if it's, if they're, if they're a being split from one egg, do they share mm -hmm. a soul as well as a consciousness? Um, because there's also this sense of, of um, one being in you know, Neville being the fiery. I mean, I'm thinking about what Christian has, has raised as well, you know, that, that Helena is sort of the virtuous pair and um, Neville is advised to think to her as a model of what can be done in terms of control, of self-control, of mm -hmm. restraint. So I'm just wondering how this, this clear twinning fits into this other argument about um, the split self. Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly speaks to the, this, this, the kind of uncontainability of the malady, right? I mean, if we do think of Jasper as being having this kind of rigid alienation, having this kind of rigid split, then, um, I mean, this you know, offers yet another kind of echo of that. Maybe one of the ways that that's working then is to sort of push us in the direction of of thinking that that Jasper is kind of shamming um, that this this sort of like this split in in his self. Um, is you know if if these two who as you say are are kind of literally split right if we think of them in in those terms of coming from the same egg it, if they have been divided into people who sh who you know share a consciousness um then surely this one individual we should not take seriously the kind of divide that he has and and maybe that would then go back to the the question about Wilkie Collins um and not wanting to repeat what Collins had done um so i think that i mean that maybe is is the best that I could say about the the Landless twins is um, that they offer a kind of counter argument, right? Um, mm -hmm. I guess you know if we wanted to hold on to the notion of Jasper as being split, that you know somehow their unity is a is, is a sign of virtue or something like that. I'm not sure how far we could go with that, um, but but I would think that that maybe the best way to think about them is as a kind of a counterbalance or as sort of contrary evidence um to the sort of forster argument by the way in which this novel was to end does that hold water for you it does and i also just want to suggest that since there have been um, parallels made between sort of eastern connection that the landless twins have to Jasper's eastern side that maybe there is in um the notion of helena as virtuous this potential for jasper to um to find a virtuous side of himself as he himself may later on, you know, if the novel had been continued and Jasper had um, interrogated himself in prison um, and identified himself as the murderer, but not himself, that those two sides would have emerged as, as kind of like the landless twins embodied in one. Which again, I mean, to go back to Christian's point is, you know, yet further evidence that this is not a Dickens going in a new and hopeful direction, <laughs> right? Um, that here, once again, we get this kind of like demonized version of like the villainous East. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I mean, I, I don't like that, but um, I think that's a, a good argument. Austin, go ahead. Uh, after some interesting questions, I'm worried mine's like an annoying one about terminology, but maybe you, you could help me unpack a, a friction I'm, I'm trying to to think through. Um, you, you're talking a lot about what well, like the basis of your book is about this dualist theory of mind. Um, but you also like uh link it with uh among others, Anna Gibson talking about Jane Eyre and like a a term she seems to prefer to dualist is like unity or unified theory of mind. And I and I'm just wondering like, is that the same thing? Should I understand these unity and dualist as kind of like synonyms, or is there a nuanced distinction that's there? Part of what's at stake in this is me thinking about the idea of unity and like what your talk's underscoring now is like there's there's clash sometimes between the the kind of the material and the immaterial, even yeah. in, in dualism. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um I, I I think that that Anna Gibson I think that that is her terminology and her terminology alone. Um, I don't think I've encountered it elsewhere. And so I, I, I don't want to speak, um, you know, I don't want to put words in, in, in her mouth or anything like that. Um, for me, I guess that I would prefer the language of, of dualism because uh, I think that one of the important things for somebody like Dickens and, and some of the, you know, somebody like Abercrombie or some of those kind of more, um, what I'm calling sort of orthodox or mainstream thinkers, at least in the first part of the century, kind of the middle of the century, is that that unity, one of the important aspects of it is that it is a temporary unity, 
right? Um, that this is um, a terminable connection, right? That um, there is a privileged half of this, this duality. Um, and it's, you know, pretty clear that it's the immaterial half. And then oftentimes with Dickens, and I sort of alluded to this in, in thinking about, you know, how we're to understand Chris Sparkle and that kind of like absent-minded walk to the weir where he discovers when he returns the next day, um, Edwin's watch and shirt pin is this thing that Dickens plays with all the time. Um, I think he's most explicit about it in Oliver Twist, where he talks about those hypnagogic states with, with Oliver, where um, he says at one point, I'm paraphrasing badly here, but he says at one point in Oliver Twist that like, sometimes in that state between sleeping and waking, we get a glimpse of the soul's capacious powers when sort of freed from its corporeal associate. Um, and that sense of the relationship is not only Dickens, but I think is, is pretty prevalent among kind of dualist thinkers that if anything, the body limits the other half, right? So if that's a unity or a unified self, it's a unity that both has a clear sort of like winner and loser. Um, and it's a unity that hinders the, the preferred term there, right? Um, that we will no more see further, et cetera, et cetera, when we are finally freed from our corporeal prisons. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't know that I would use the language of a kind of unified self. Um, I think it's important to hang on to that, that duality. Eddie, go ahead. Hi. Thanks. Thanks so much, Tyson. Um, always learning from you. I have a question um, that builds on a quote from one of your slides, where you talk about that moment when, when the particular case of Jasper is described as a horrible wonder apart. And that leads me to think um, and ask you a question about the relationship or the utility of the case, the relationship between the part and the whole. Like when we're trying to develop theories of the mind, mm -hmm. whether that's Eliotson citing Coombe's anecdote about the Irish porter, or these moments in fiction where we see one individual um, sometimes set as distinct from, unintelligible, inscrutable to the average person, then, then I do have questions about sort of the utility of the case in helping us produce theories of, of the general. And of course, this is a veiled way of asking, you know, questions about the limits of fiction. Um, you know, <laughs> what, what can fiction teach us about anything other than provide us with the case? Um, but since the case study is so so entangled with psychology and psychoanalysis in in the you know the twentieth century, I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more about the ways in which the case, the the particular, the study of the one thing can help us leverage larger arguments or larger understandings of the whole? Is it just, you know, an illumination of a larger thing that still is dim or, or is it something else? So, you know, what's, what, what's the case work here? Yeah. I mean, that's obviously, the, it's obviously an important question for me because so much of this book is about, um, you know, the sort of inwardness of these first person narratives. Um, this is the problem with Zoom is that now I've lost where Eddie went. Um, so I'll just sort of <laughs> speak generally to all these many faces. Um, but the argument of the book is, is absolutely about, you know, fiction's way of, of kind of expanding the case, right? Expanding the case, not in the sense of um, to the, the group, but expanding the case in terms of its duration, expanding the kind of depth and breadth of the individual case. Uh, so yeah, that absolutely is, is essential to my argument. Um, and I think that, that like, I'm thinking now of a novel like David Copperfield, maybe in part because it's so close to Dickens' own kind of conception of himself, but that novel, I think, is absolutely riven with the sort of tensions between the individual case as representative, the individual case as showing us, you know, a, a kind of architecture of interiority that, you know, is, is generally applicable versus insisting on the individual as unique, as special, as different and frankly, better 
than everyone else, um, right? I mean, David Copperfield, like Dickens, much of the argument of that novel is that this is somebody special. This is somebody who is particularly gifted. Um, and so at the same time that that novel is sort of trying to offer us a vision of, of selfhood, it is, I think, torn between precisely that divide that you're talking about, Eddie, between this as kind of representative or general versus this as, um, you know, the uniquely gifted individual. Um, I do think that that this sort of narrative move on Dickens' part, right, this, this kind of increasing space that I'm talking about in the book, that he grants interiority, introspection, is founded, generally speaking, on a kind of faith in the case as representative, the case as, you know, um, promising us a, a sort of vision of consciousness that, that we can sort of confirm by turning inwards ourselves. Um, so I think that like, for, for the idea to work in some ways, it needs to be generalizable, it needs to be um, making an argument that this is a representative self that is being, that is being treated here. Um, but it, it's 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 not an easy equation for Dickens, right? It is certainly in a novel like David Copperfield, it, it runs up against the sort of things that make the individual different. Am, am I at all sort of getting at the the heart of what you're thinking about, or am I kind of? No, 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 no. That's really super helpful. Um, and, and again, you know, this is one of the larger questions about fiction: How do these special characters grant yeah. us any insight into the the average? person you know you remind me of of that line in in Doyle's uh, you know in the Sherlock Holmes stories when he's citing Winwood Reed that you know as, as an individual a man's mind is is inscrutable but taken in the average you can you can always deduce what's happening and so it seems to be in that case um sort of a turn away from a faith in the individual case as representative of or granting us access to to a larger knowledge. Um, so it's, it seems that Dickens has that faith, you're saying. Within limits, right? Because there, there is always still that, that insistence on kind of irreducible difference, irreducible uniqueness. Um, so it is, I mean, there is a kind of like, there is a real tension there, absolutely. Um, so, you know, 90% faith, uh, something like that. Good enough. <laughs> That's an A. Carl. Well, I'd like to get back to the idea of the divided self rather than selves represented as divided people. We see Bradley Headstone and our mutual friend barely able to contain his sexual jealousy when he hammers his hand against the wall. It seems to me that Jasper can only contain his, well, he can't contain his sexual jealousy. It has to be separated from his body. Mm -hmm. And when Leon Garfield completed Edwin Drood, he was under the assumption that Dickens was after what Robert Louis Stevenson was able to accomplish 18 years later, 17 years later, in Jekyll and Hyde, and that Wilde even carried further with the picture of Dorian Gray, where sexuality, uh, liberation must be separated in the Victorian body in order to exist. Um, do you think Dickens had the capacity to go in that direction? Um, do, you, do you think if he had finished it, it would have ended with, in fact, Jasper existing in two separate selves and the mechanism for dividing those selves would have either been hypnosis or opium? Hmm. Well, I mean, in terms of the the... the... Just one thing as you were speaking, I, I, I'm not sure what my, I sort of go back and forth about whether I, I really believe that Jasper is this thoroughly divided, right? Whether we're really meant to to take at face value Forster's assumption that we're going to end up with a Jasper who is utterly split. Uh, I mean, I, I imagine if he's in the prison cell that uh, one of those selves is, you know, perpetually um unavailable, right? I mean, if, if the mechanism is opium or mesmerism or something like that, that that's simply not happening in the prison cell. So it, it seems to me that if we go along that that path, um, then that kind of, that dark self or that sexual self is 
sort of forever cordoned off, right? Forever sort of like kept in the dark. Um, and there's no kind of mechanism to bring it back. But I'm thinking, and I, I'm blanking on, on which critic made this argument at this moment, but I'm thinking of um, the scenes with Edwin and I mean, even his his nickname for um, for Rosa Bud, right? He calls her pussy, and I think that there are critics who have have seen this as Dickens being crass, right? Dickens as, as kind of like having a sexual joke. Um, so, like Edwin too, in that sense, is presented as a kind of sexual being. Um, so I'm not sure that it's like sexuality writ large that that needs to be sort of cordoned off but rather there's something about jasper's sexuality or jasper's desire that is that, that goes too far that is inappropriate um am, am i sort of like getting at what you're thinking of or have i misunderstood well i i guess i'm wondering whether you believe that that the relationship or the divided Victorian mind, particularly the male mind, uh, as it gets expressed in the 80s and 90s, was Dickens that far ahead of his time, do you think? Was he trying to um, comment on the inability of the his own conventional life compared with the unconventional life that Wilkie Collins led? Mm -hmm. Is he trying to find a way for a man to have two separate lives. And of course, in Jekyll and Hyde, we find out that it can't, it can't happen, that, that it can't exist. And of course, it can't exist in Dorian Gray either because uh, it has to be physically separated. Um, and, and yet it doesn't get resolved that a man can have a passionate life and a sexually open life perhaps until the early 20th century in literature, I mean. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you start, well, the temptation here, of course, is is because you've talked about Collins' unconventional life. Um, the temptation is to go to biography, right? And Dickens at this point is hardly leaving, leading a conventional life. Um, he's had this very public uh, split with, with his wife. Um, he's been having this affair for, at this point, years and years and years, right? So he has in his life found a way, I guess, um, to to live maybe not as unconventionally as, as Collins, um, but he's still sort of like pursuing his desires and, and at this point not facing a ton of consequence as opposed to like maybe the sort of blow up a couple of decades earlier. Um, in terms of the fiction, you, you mentioned Bradley Headstone and... I guess I don't read Bradley Headstone's issue just as being desire or passion that needs, you know, that, that that he can't control. I guess I read that more as the problem with Bradley Headstone is that his is a kind of working class desire or passion, right? Um, that it's it's that kind of suspicion or distrust of Bradley's class position that's really at issue there as opposed to, you know, sexuality or desire or anything like that. Um, so, and, and I think that like, again, it, it's hard to speculate about how this novel is going to wrap up, but if we think about Dickens' earlier fiction, there are plenty of examples of, um, you know, what seems like a kind of healthy, uh, sexuality that, that these characters are able to realize. It's just, you know, the middle-class characters, um, that are rewarded in that way. So I guess I don't see it, things as being a split for, for Dickens, maybe. Well, it's, interest, it's interesting that you say that because when Bradley hits his hand against the wall, I certainly didn't think he was thinking about class. Well, no, I don't think he's <laughs> thinking about class, right? But I think that Dickens is sort of repulsed by him precisely because of his class position, if that makes sense. So that, that, that what's offensive about that is that like he's othered in those terms, right? In those kind of class terms. He, yeah, but he's not thinking about class. I agree with you. Thank you. Wayne, go ahead. Yes, I have to begin with a personal anecdote. I was prescribed an opiate many years ago after my wisdom teeth were pulled out. 
I swear that under the effect of that opiate, I played Mozart better <laughs> than I ever had before. And since when, the, when my prescription ran out, then I had to go back to making mistakes, <laughs> playing it too slowly, et cetera. But my question concerns the drug experimentation that went on in the Victorian period. Clearly, they, uh, there was some reservations about opium. Later on, cocaine, I believe, became the drug of choice. And one comment made about it was that it was, unlike opium, it, it made the mind clearer. So I'm just wondering if the effect of cocaine was uh, a point where maybe the immaterial and the material minds could meet and cooperate. <laughs> just wondering. <laughs> I, it's not just because this is being recorded that I'm going to disavow any knowledge, but I, um, that, that is, yeah, I, does anyone want to speak to that? Because I, I will confess to, to not being able to. Yeah, I don't, I mean, um, so that, that cocaine offers a way to to bring the immaterial mind. I mean, the the, the notion that that yeah, I don't I don't even know where to go with that. Um, I, I don't know enough about about sort of um, the use of cocaine later um, to to really speak to that. And I hope that John's hand being raised is an offer to speak to that. Quite, no, um, but I mean, obviously. <laughs> you know, thinking of De Quincey or somebody like that, um, the, the use of opium absolutely in, in all kinds of cases fits in perfectly with this notion of, you know, even opium is offering a way of like detaching from the body, detaching from the being bound to the physical form. So I think that opium certainly in, in, in all kinds of different cases um, offers, you know, perhaps even a kind of uh, a means of proving the detachability of, of body and mind or something for, for people like De Quincey or, 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 or others. And I'll maybe let romanticists speak to that. Um, but yeah, the cocaine thing, I, I, I was hoping that someone would jump in on that, but yeah, I don't know. John, I feel kind of sad that you're not about to jump in on that, but go ahead and jump in where you want to. <laughs> no, I cannot speak to that particular question. So um, I, I regret that I can't resolve the, the issue that was just raised about um, uh, experimentation with uh, cocaine um, in the 19th century uh, or <laughs> the 20th and 21st. Uh, my, my question uh, ha has to do with first person narration. And I really like the um, the way that you insist on uh, bringing together both the, the content of Dickens's thinking about theories of mind and the Victorian controversies and the form of his fiction. So, so form and content together, the, the what and the how are for you really essential. And you talk about introspection. So there, there are two aspects of, of the form of Dickens's novels that may be related to the questions that you are dealing with. Um, and I'll, 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 I'll present them separately, but perhaps they are related. One has to, you, do, to do with the, uh, the topic or the motif of doubling in mm -hmm. Dickens. And for example, uh, uh, Uriah Heep is often read as a projection of an abjected uh, form of Dickens's own uh, or of David's own own self. So, so the and there are many other ways in which characters are examined in in pairs. And so, does does the use of doubling in in other Dickens novels and the Uriah Heep and Steerforth is also read as a, as a kind of double uh, acting out something that, that David would like to perform but does not. So that's the first question. And then the, the second question that may or may not be related but also has to do with first person narration is that in the strictly first person 
novels. That is to say, the Esther section of Bleak House and uh, and David Copperfield and Great Expectations. One of the distinctive features about that is that they are retrospective. That is, mm -hmm. there is an older self that is looking back at a younger self. So the narrating self and the experiencing self are, are also paired or, or, or doubles or uh, unified or, or not unified. So, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one aspect of that is the use of present tense narration, which comes up in, in other novels besides those that are strictly first person. So, so uh, those are, are a motif of doubling and the form of first person retrospective narration that I think are related to doubling and perhaps double consciousness. So any thoughts you have, I would be interested in. Yeah, um, I mean, the, the doubling, as I sort of alluded to in the talk, um, on the one hand, like this is, as as you say, I mean, an absolutely typical move on Dickens' part. Um, and, and so part of what I was trying to argue about this novel is that this is something that is perfectly typical and 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 almost sort of banal in Dickens fiction, um, the sort of device of doubling or or splitting or things like that. Um, but then it takes on a, a different kind of resonance here um, because of the context of the invocation of double consciousness. Um, in terms of the, the those sort of the sense of doubling in terms of past and present selves. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess one of the things thinking about David Copperfield, um, one of the the sort of you mentioned John, and now I, I don't see where you've gone. Uh, you mentioned John the, the the kind of use of present tense um, in David Copperfield. There is this sort of like immediacy. So 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 often in that novel where David is sort of re-experiencing, um, you know, whether it's the the sort of abuse of Murdstone or whatever it might be, um, and and switches to present tense in those cases. Um, there's also that strange way in which David kind of externalizes his memory so frequently, right? Um, that we, you know, he encounters or he sees himself as a young child, you know, running away um, from school or, or, you know, on the road, whatever it might be. Uh, I mean, that, I talk about that in, in my chapter on David Copperfield, I talk about that as um, being a kind of sign of, of just how how desperately important for David the kind of existence of memory is because memory becomes for him in some ways this is to go back to Eddie's question too memory becomes for him this sort of guarantee of the sort of self that he possesses right this sort of guarantee of his his gifts this guarantee that he was born with powers of observation and and so on uh, that mark him out as somebody special that mark him out as somebody unique um and my argument in in that chapter has to do with um the notion of innate gifts the notion of inborn gifts and the way that those in the 19th century came to stand as sort of evidence of you know a god that exists to give us those gifts um and so for for you know, David Copperfield, those kind of encounters with his past self, those encounters with memory seem to me to be important as um, sort of guarantees of those gifts of the, the sort of inborn qualities. Um, I'm trying to think of, if, you know, Esther, the, the ways in which Esther plays with with doubling or or, or even Pip, um, certainly with Pip, there's a kind of ironic distance, right? He insists on, um, you know, how much he has learned since his past self. Uh, you know, he has learned um, since the mistakes of his past self and 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 that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I guess I hadn't really thought about it in in terms of 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 doubling, um, but you're right. I mean. Those arguments, as you say, there, there are lots and lots of readings of David Copperfield that see, as you said, you know, Uriah as um, all of those things that David is most ashamed of, um, Steerforth as the, you know, the kind of things that he longs for, the the, the sort of 
qualities and capacities that he wishes to have for himself. Um, I mean, I suppose one way of thinking about that is just that, and I think that um, Karen Chase is is maybe the person who's, um, for me, made made the best kind of argument about um, Dickens sort of like spreading self out among multiple characters. Um, and and Austin mentioned earlier Anna Gibson, who I think has gone in similar directions, thinking about like a network version of the self. Um, for me, though, I mean, I, I'm kind of resistant to those arguments because. Um, when I think of like David and Uriah, absolutely Uriah represents qualities um, that we see in David. Um, but for David, it is absolutely imperative that Uriah be somebody separate from him, right? That, that, that he's able to sort of, um, you know, disavow those qualities, insist upon his difference from Uriah, um, insist on, on his own kind of uniqueness as opposed to the clear limitations of somebody like Uriah Heep. Am, am I sort of getting at, I know you just asked for thoughts, John, but uh, am I sort of getting at the, the kind of questions you were interested in? Oh, I think you're muted. Yes, thank you. That, that's, that's helpful, Tyson. And uh, um... Um, nothing nothing further but thank okay. you Harriet I'm very fond of Burgess and I um, appreciate your depiction of him in this talk as a kind of mechanical figure who is driven by uh, the clock perhaps or you know, that he's he seems robotic and yet, when he he um, acquires his chivalric um, mission, he transforms a little bit. There's a, um, two moments in the novel that I find really compelling. Um, one is when he first sees Jasper as the pile of, of garments on the floor. When when he when Jasper discovers that Edwin um, was going to that Rosa and Edwin were going to separate and not get married and that whatever action he may or may not have performed was futile, he, he becomes a pile of clothes on the floor. And then later on, when Grugis recognizes the, the import of that, he thinks again about the pile of clothes on the floor. So the body disappears. And I'm wondering, just in terms of, of what you're discussing here, how that image operates in your argument. Just because of... Uh, uh... Jasper's collapse, right? When he makes the revelation, is that what you're thinking of? But also specifically that Grugis doesn't think about, Grugis just calls attention to the garments on the floor, that they're just clothes. He doesn't actually think about the body at that point. And twice, he just refers to the clothes as opposed to the man. Um, and of course, you know, clothes make the man, but, but there's this outer shell now um, of how he costumes himself in the world that is all that is left on the floor for Grugis to see and for Grugis to later on recognize as the revelation of what had been occurring in that moment. So, mm -hmm. so there's something else other than the body and the mind and the soul, but there's that costume that he wears in the world that is all that's left when there's a revelation about to what he's done and how Grugis recognizes that. Yeah. And, uh, I don't, it's not really a question so much as yeah, an yeah. observation and a, a wondering, what do you make of that? I mean, I hadn't thought a ton about I hadn't thought a ton about Jasper's clothes because what seems most interesting is is sort of Grugis's part in that, right? Um, that Grugis's reaction is not to accuse Jasper. Um, I don't. I'm, I'm I'm trying to think if the novel ever actually gives us Grugis's interiority with regard to Jasper, right? We never see Grugis thinking. Oh, I get what that means. Um, we have that illustration of, of the two of them by the fire. Um, clearly, he's registering what this suggests about Jasper. Um, but it's all, you know, kept inside. Um, it's, it's, it's all entirely hidden from his surface. We do get moments of interiority with Grugis. Um, and those moments of interiority are... Uh, maybe to go back to the question about desire earlier, are 
these these kind of they're presented as these sort of like sweet moments of uh, a kind of enduring love for Rosa's dead mother um, that makes him, the, you know, the kind of good character that that Jasper clearly is not. So this is he he offers us a kind of you know sentimentalized vision of what love or desire should be for Dickens, um, that it becomes this kind of moral force that, of course, you know, drives Grugis to, to, to sort of protect Rosa and to hide her away and, and to do all the things that he does in the second part of what exists of the novel. Um, I mean, maybe, maybe just sort of riffing on that notion of kind of like a, a pile of clothes, maybe what that suggests then is, you know, Jasper's lack of that interiority. Um, what we get, what Jasper's core is, is that kind of like devilish anger that um, that he reveals to Edwin in, what is it, the, the second or third chapter, um, where he talks about, you know, the monks carving images of devils or whatever it is into the, into the church pews, that, that Jasper's interiority, when he gives us a glimpse of it, Right? when he suggests to Edwin that he's aware of it, is this sort of like, this rotten thing, um, that there is a kind of fundamental emptiness to him if what, const you know, what constitutes Grugis essential goodness is this like, this flame that he's been carrying for, for Rose's mother all these years. Um, so, I mean, that's maybe one way to, to deal with the clothes thing. Um, but yeah, I, I guess for me, what's most interesting about that scene is just, we know what Grudges is thinking, but it's never revealed to us, right? That instead he has this core, this sort of, this good core um, that he can nevertheless keep some something of a secret. I have a question if, if I can jump in here. Um, okay, Susie, do you, would you, well, I'm going to ask my question and then Susie, I'm going to go to you. Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, I had a question about the, about the Henry Lewis essay that you started with Tyson, um, mm -hmm. because it's, um, a question about, sorry, my, my internet has just decided it's unstable. Um, uh, a, a question about the, the Dickens in relation to criticism article that you started with. Um, just because that article is is so weird in so many ways um and you know so there are there are the there was the part you were talking about with the frogs there's like a weird part where he talks about dickens characters in relation to puppets which is also kind of like a weird moment when you are trying to think about psychology but then there's there's the, like a whole section i can't remember exactly what the words are where he basically talks about like people who are delusional and like Dickens, like people who like Dickens kind of buying into Dickens like weird kind of like delusional imaginary things. And so I was wondering if maybe you could talk a little bit about like about that version of psychology that we get in there, the idea that like, you know, so there are all of these, these, you know, there, there are questions about Dickens's materialism and Dickens's sort of like mechanistic characters, but also the idea that everybody who reads Dickens is part of this like weird shared delusional existence. And like yeah. how that, you know, how that maybe how that version of, of psychology fits into the, the other versions of psychology that you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, um, Forster, if, if, if you haven't read Forster's description of that essay of, of Dickens in relation to criticism, he goes off on that part, right? Um, is, is sort of furious about it. Because of course, what Lewis is arguing there is not just that the people who who like Dickens are kind of being infected by this sort of like disease perception, but he essentially says that Dickens himself is hallucinatory, right? That Dickens himself has this thing in common with the insane. Um, and oh my, I cannot believe that at this moment I am just totally blanking on his name. Um, but Lewis isn't the first to do this. I mean, he's sort of taking this uh, from a French critic. Oh my God, I am just, it's gone right out of my head. Um, but but yeah, I mean, I, I talk about that turn in the book as, I mean, it, it, it's, 
it's obviously a way of like cutting out the ground from underneath Dickens, right? To say he's 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 not entirely well. He's he doesn't Lewis doesn't quite say that. Lewis sort of says it's like the hallucinations of the insane. Yes, thank you very much, Christian. Yeah, it's Tane who I was thinking of. Um, but yeah, so he it, it, it's a way of kind of undercutting Dickens of of, of suggesting even a kind of danger in Dickens fiction, right? That there is this kind of infectious quality to it, that it that it leads us to to misperceive. Um, and of course, it's, you know, it's as as others have talked about, it's a way for Lewis to sort of adopt the language of the clinician, right? Um, to sort of say, well, yeah, you know, people like this, but there's something kind of unhealthy about it. Um, which is entirely different from the way that Lewis first talked about Dickens fiction. When 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 Lewis first reviewed, I think it's Pickwick and maybe Oliver Twist, um, just like overflowing, absolutely effusive with, with praise for how accurate, how perceptive Dickens had been. And now that becomes a kind of disease perception by the time of that essay. Um, so, I mean, those are the terms in which I tend to think of that turn as a way of, of just sort of like, you know, it's an easy way to win an argument if you can call into question the rationality of your opponent. Um, it's a way of, you know, as as others, I think Rosemary Bodenheimer talks about it in these terms uh, of, of sort of wielding the language of a kind of more scientific psychology. Um, and I think that often psychophysiologists their work tends to get positioned in those terms. It's not as though the kind of psychology that Dickens is engaging with is in any way uh, in the period unscientific. Um, but that is sometimes how the, the divide gets articulated and psychophysiologists sort of tend to offer their work as, as kind of more, um, you know, more scientific in, in the most sort of up-to-date terms. It's, it's a way of wielding that kind of power um, of, of, you know, just as, as using the frogs is like, I have, you know, cut open the brains of frogs. I have been in the laboratory. Um, Dickens has not. I am and thus in a position to, to sort of comment on his fiction, on the way that his fiction works, on the way that his fiction infects the minds of his readers. But also implicitly, I, I am, you know, a better authority on questions of the mind more generally. Don't go to, to, to novels like Dickens if you want to understand human consciousness come to me come to those of us who have actually you know wielded the scalpel um we're the ones who can who can tell you how this actually works i love that i have i have authority because i have squished a frog brain <laughs> <laughs> susie go ahead thank you tyson um that was great and obviously we've talked about a lot of this in the past but i have um a couple of thoughts and I mean I'll just follow up on the Lewis and and I want to say that are are you really being fair to Lewis um so I don't I mean Lewis spends much of the physical basis of mine um separating himself entirely from Huxley and and he um is refusing to reduce mine purely to the mechanical or the physical so um i think he says something like um consciousness as subjective fact can never be material so i wonder what you do with that that's the first part but then i have a second question well i don't want to just say i don't believe him but i mean yeah i mean it, Lewis, I think, most accurately would be described as like a dual aspect monist, right? Um, that that yes, he is saying there's always a subjective side to any kind of physiological fact, but and so maybe calling him reductionist. Again, I'm being recorded, so I'm not going to say that I'm being unfair. Um, there will be no evidence where I admit that, but I, I I think that I mean he's still he's still miles away from anything that would be acceptable to somebody like John Abercrombie, anything that would be acceptable, I think, to somebody like Dickens. Um, and I don't want to, maybe I am sort of more fair in the book, I don't want to entirely treat these two as adversaries. I, I start the book with like conversations that Lewis and Dickens would have about psychology, and they were friends. Um, it's just that, you know, after Dickens was dead, Lewis stabbed him in the back with this essay, but no. Um, but so, 
dual aspect monism, the, the kind of theory that 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 Lewis offers, it's not as reductive as as Huxley, perhaps, but it's still for the kind of like religiously inclined dualist like Dickens entirely unacceptable. And he still does, you know, erase any sense of transcending the physical, any sense of of, of a kind of future life detached from the physical. Um, but yeah, he's not Huxley. Uh, absolutely. Okay, so related in a way is my um, second question now, which is, I how far do you think Dickens is identifying consciousness and soul? I thought you suggested he is. Oh, I think I think one hundred percent. One hundred percent. Ninety nine percent. No, no, I absolutely think he. I think I think he's everywhere. I, th I think he's everywhere doing that. I mean, he's quite explicit about that. Um, you know, again, like that passage from Oliver Twist, where he says, we get a glimpse of the soul's capacious powers from freed from, from its bodily associate. Um, what, what is it in, in that that makes you suspicious? Okay, well, so, I mean, are you saying they are identical? Because I, I, I think I can't agree with that anymore. It seems to me that what and this is a way of saving dickens he can say that there is a soul and you get glimmers of that through introspection and through conscience and whatever but there's also consciousness and consciousness is he's aware that it's material in all sorts of ways i mean this goes back to harriet's question as well about the twin consciousness that was entirely grounded in ideas of the materiality of the brain um and and in similar ways, I mean, Dickens is so aware of neurological problems. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's named he's named many of them. He knows that the brain distorts and consciousness distorts and people have, you know, double aspects of their personality. So it seems to me that maybe some aspect of consciousness gives you insight into the soul, but he is really aware that there's a material dimension that may be completely different than the soul and you can think of laura bridgman there yeah, yeah. Where he says, you know she has no senses um so she didn't have language he has yeah. sense deficit and yet that soul was in there and once she could get some language it could start to emerge no i, I think that i think we're just sort of i think we're saying the same thing but we're we're sort of speaking at, at kind of cross purposes Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, in in the talk, um, I talk about you know the soul's powers when when sort of um, when when no longer constrained by the body. And I think that maybe that's the ways in which the way in which Dickens would talk about this. That yes, of course, the consciousness is bound by um, the physical body, is affected by the physical body. Um, you know, you might see ghosts on Christmas Eve that are a product of, you know, the little bit of undigested beef, right? Um, that there's more of gravy than of grave to, to the ghosts that, that come to Scrooge, uh, he insists when he first um, encounters Jacob Marley. So yes, absolutely. Um, what I think, though, is that the notion that consciousness or that that ourselves, that the first person pronoun can be affected by the body, can be led astray by the body, can be constrained by the body. Um, yes, absolutely. But I think that Dickens nevertheless sees that that I, that self, as the the, the sort of immaterial soul that eventually will be detached from that physical component that distorts that misleads that does that so i i don't think that we're disagreeing i think we're just does yeah. that fit yeah for no, it does yeah thank you we have time for maybe one more question if there's one more question we could also solve the mystery of edwin drood if we wanted <laughs> Or we have four minutes to solve the mystery of Edwin Drood. Do we buy it? Do we think first that Edwin is dead? And do we think second that, that Jasper did it? Or are we, are we all just perfectly impartial? No one make, wants to make an argument? Edwin is dead and Jasper did it. Okay. 
Agreements, disagreements? Agree. <laughs> Although well, it is coming after our mutual friend where there is there there is a huge revelation at the end, so you never know. I haven't been paying attention to the chat. I don't know if there are questions. David, go ahead. David, go ahead. Well, I have a strong interest in the development of the mystery form. And Dickens's death leaves us at a division point. Is he dead or isn't he? Which uh, Sheridan Lafanu had done before in Wilder's Hand, but uh, I'm not going to decide. Is he dead or isn't he? The clues certainly are strongly in favor of his being dead, and something is clearly wrong with John Jasper, but uh, Dickens occasionally. Uh, fools us deliberately. In some ways, it's satisfying that what we've got ends with that question unresolved. If we want, I mean, if we want to take that, that BBC version uh, as definitive, um, and again, I'm just going to spoil it. I probably wouldn't watch it. Um, the 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 big reveal there is that Edwin is not dead, um, but that John Jasper has, in an opium haze, strangled. Wait for it. His own father, who is also Edwin's father, returned. <laughs> so, I, I, does that count as a solution? <laughs> not my solution, but. No. Kind of a cheat. Sorry? Kind of a cheat. Solution. It is a cheat, yeah. Yeah, well, there are better solutions than that. Yeah. <laughs> well, we are just at the end of our time. So, Tyson, thank you so, so much for this wonderful session. And thank you all for being here and for your questions and for, um, for everything. Thank you for the Pickwick Club, too. Thank yes. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Tyson. This was wonderful. Hope to see you this summer in Santa Cruz, if you can come. That would be wonderful. <laughs> thank you. Goodbye, and thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>